Um, so the local activists and experts we have today to talk about the work we're doing on these issues in New Jersey are Amy Goldsmith, Clean Water Action New Jersey State Director, and Eric Benson, our campaign director. Um, so they're going to be talking a little bit more about the New Jersey side of these issues on um, what we're currently working on, um, just to give you a sense of how, even though these issues, as you've seen in the film, are very broad and global, there's work that can be done at a local level and state level that play a role in that whole kind of global issue. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I'll be asking some questions to kind of get the discussion started, but you'll be able to ask some questions if you see the, at the bottom of your screen the Q&A, or um, you can also put them in the chat as well, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. And if we can't get to everything, I'll definitely follow up with any of you on your questions, and I'll also send around this um, great research guide that was put together by the Story of Stuff Project, um, Break Free from Plastic, um, the groups that put together the film. So I'll send those around to the emails you use to sign up for this um, later on. So um, why don't we get started, I guess. First, I'd like each of you to just introduce yourselves and if you have anything to add about, you know, what you've been, your you know, history with the organization and then we'll get into what we're working on right now. So why don't we start with you, Amy? All right. So first, what I want to do is actually introduce more to me <laughs> because she didn't say who she was. She's our Rethink Disposable Organizer and she'll talk more about that as well. But um, I'm the New Jersey State Director. I've been with Clean Water Action for um, what is now, I'm, this is my 35th anniversary Memorial Day weekend. So I started in the Boston office uh, working on water and waste and actually incinerator campaigns uh, back then. So uh, I've been with uh, the New Jersey office since 1992 and um, I love this organization because we um, are always fighting and winning and, um, and we're sort of uh, a little friskier than other organizations. So you'll hear about some of the things that we're doing and how we uh, do our work, you know, really from extraction to disposal. And we've been doing it for decades and decades um, at the grassroots level. So I've been part of that, been really privileged to be part of that and I work with a great team. So. All right, thank you. And Eric. Great. Uh, my name is Eric Benson, and I started off with Clean Water Action in 2003 as a uh, field canvasser. It was the first job I got when I graduated from college. Not really not knowing what I wanted to do with my life. I, I didn't know I was going to become an environmental activist. I was just concerned about the issues, um, but needed a job to support myself. And I was able to get some on-the-job training, some uh, you know life exposure. And you know, when you find something that you enjoy doing, you're making a difference, you can support yourself doing it. I wound up sticking around for a long time doing it. Um, over the course of time, I took on you know, additional responsibilities, just being the field canvas to, to managing that um, and directing it for a long time out of our Montclair, New Jersey office um, in the last year and a half or so. Um, in addition to the, the birth of our firstborn little daughter, um, I've taken on some additional responsibilities with this, the, the organization. I'm, I'm now the statewide campaigns director, and that's um, in, involving going to, to Trenton to do lobbying, uh, doing community meetings you know, with volunteers and uh, a lot of our great supporters and, and just making, you know, doing some of the election work that we're doing uh, in critical years. So thanks for having us, Maura. Thank you. All right, so I guess let's get started. Um, so the film, which I think was, was amazing, it covered a lot of issues, um, shows how the plastics value chain is very complex and spans the entire globe. Um, so I want to ask each of you, um, based on your experience working in New Jersey, what stage of the plastic value chain from extraction or plastic production, distribution, consumption, disposal, um, what, which of those stages are happening in New Jersey? So Eric, why don't you start? Because you do a lot of the extractions part of it. Yeah, I mean, 
you think about um, you know New Jersey, we are we are a very densely populated state, uh, and so um, we have we have a lot of people, um, which means we, we we buy a lot of stuff, and we talk about this you know in, in lots of different ways. You know, just um, you know, we have the the largest you know port on the East Coast, and and so when you think about like this whole cycle, you know, where we're, we're extracting it, and it's not far. It's Pennsylvania, it's right next door. And you know we share you know the Delaware River is a border there. They're not actually you know extracting within that you know watershed right now, but it's it's not far from here. Um, you know we make these products. We you know we 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 ship them. Um, we ship the the fossil fuels to other places. China makes stuff, ships it back to us, you know, and and then we buy it, consume it, and then we some of it that we recycle was going to China, not anymore. Um, you know, we have uh, three big incinerators in New Jersey. So a lot of this stuff, you know, the end ends up right there. And certainly the coastline, you know, it's, uh, you know, the New Jersey coast is a big moneymaker for the state, but also, you know, subject to a lot of this waste and, and stream. Um, the, the whole plastics and, and energy, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the Empower New Jersey campaign that we're working on, no new fossil fuels, but we're a big pipeline state. You know, it's not like we're extracting the materials here, um, but, you know, they want to build the pipelines in New Jersey to get the gas and, and fossil fuels to other markets, either to create it, burn it, you know, bury it or, or create products out of it. So um, in addition to, to consuming a lot of it, you know, they want to make New Jersey the, the path through state. So those are some of the areas that I'm involved in. We can't hear you, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sure. um, so I guess um, we'll start before we get to you, Amy. Eric, could you go a little bit deeper into the fossil fuel infrastructure project side of what's happening in New Jersey? Yeah, so here in New Jersey, as it relates to the overall fossil fuel infrastructure that supports the plastics industry as well. Yes. As so, so the, the fossil fuel industry needs somebody to, to buy their product and, and they're doing everything that they can to cement, you know, their future and, and, um, and, and, and lock in our dependence on, on their products. And so just in New Jersey alone, you know, we're fighting 15 different fossil fuel projects throughout the state. And this is, um, I mean, compressor stations, which helps move the gas long pipelines, again, uh, to move it to other markets. Uh, and, and then even a couple power plants that are, that are right here. We have a, a state sponsored uh, power plant, New Jersey Transit is trying to build their own fracked gas, you know, power plant. Um, and, and they're using Sandy, you know, resiliency and Sandy recovery dollars, you know, uh, from the federal government to help build that plant. Uh, and it's just, it's going to make the, the problem worse. And so um, with these 15 different projects, we're working with, you know, 100 different groups throughout the state. Uh, many of them are just kind of local in their own backyard activists saying, we, we don't want this pipeline here. We don't want this, you know, power plant in our backyards, but we don't want the in one town or a different town. We, we need to get off our dependence on fossil fuel. Um, at, at minimum, you know, we need to stop making the problem worse. Um, and then beyond that, we need to rapidly reduce our, our, our use of these fossil fuels. I think about, you know, the climate change, um, the pollution at extraction, I mean, um, the, the social costs uh, to communities and, um, and our natural resources. I mean, it's just, it's terrible. So step one is stop making the problem worse. And, and that's what this, this Empower New Jersey, it's the coalition. Um, is all working together, uh, pushing, uh, pressuring Governor Murphy to say, stop building, you know, new fossil fuels. In the movie, they talk a little bit about turning off the tap. That's the minimum. That's step one uh, of what we need to do. Um, and then we need to, you know, transition and, and use renewable energies. Um, so that's a little bit about that campaign. Thanks. And um, since we want to kind of focus on what the solutions are, um, and as an organization that works on policies, uh, can you talk a little bit about what policies are in place or are missing that are allowing the projects to continue to move forward and then what we can do about that moving forward? Yeah, I mean, the fossil fuel industry is very well funded. I mean, the policies are, are very heavily in their favor. Uh, we, we bring people power, so if we can fight back and push them um, and get them to do the right thing. but you, know, you, you talk about different, you know, the, the fossil fuel subsidies, you know, how much money, you know, they externalize the costs, you know, we help build the roads, you know, that's on the taxpayer dime, you know, so that they can get to the resources, you know, that that's, um, makes it cheaper and easier for them to, to get their, their product to markets. Um, so there's lots of fossil fuel subsidies, we need, we need to eliminate those. 
um, even in this COVID crisis, you know, uh, they're, you know, why, why were we bailing out um, fossil fuel companies when we know, you know, air pollution and our, our dependence on fossil fuels, you know, is making the problem worse. Um, you know, more locally, you know, New Jersey, you know, we need to uh, reduce the amount of waste that we create. And, and so one solution that's on the table that we've been pushing for is this statewide plastic bag ban. Um, and that's just, it, it, we need to stop creating the waste. We need to stop using it. We need to stop our reliance on it. Um, having a, a bag fee was one of the, you know, alternate proposed solutions and it doesn't, doesn't stop the waste problem. It, then we just, then we're paying for bags. Um, so the bill that's in the legislature right now is, um, you know, would, would ban, you know, single use uh, plastic bags and, and paper bags um, is one version that's in the Senate side. The assembly is still working on some of their details. Um, the towns all, all across New Jersey are helping fuel that effort by passing their own local, you know, town bag bans. And that, that's one of the things that it's, it's very effective in pushing back against these large companies because um, it all starts at the local level. Um, when you get lots of bag bans throughout New Jersey and then we're able to get a statewide ban. And as more states do more statewide bans, we're able to put pressure on the federal government. It's been a very successful strategy, you know, tactic and, and it's worked for a long time. Um, one thing that's, that's missing is this, you know, uh, corporate responsibility, you know, uh, component. If, if you make the, the, the single use disposable product, then you're responsible for its end life. Uh, and if, if you incorporated the price of that, you know, then that doesn't make the, the plastics as cheap as they look. Um, and, and the corporations are, would be responsible and, and they, they come up with different solutions because the, you know, they wouldn't want the waste. So, um, so that's something that we, we need to do. Um, one other thing, it, it's, it's not directly related to plastics, but talking about this reducing our waste uh, overall is this, um, as a food waste bill that recently got passed in the state legislature, um, passed out of both houses and the governor signed it in the last uh, two or three weeks. So it's pretty recent. And it's um, targeting large scale food op, you know, um, waste producers. And, and so if you think about a school or a jail or a hospital or a hotel or maybe grocery markets, you know, uh, a certain amount of tonnage, you know, if you hit uh, the, that tipping point, then you're required to separate your food waste. Uh, right now, food waste either gets buried in, in landfills and gets, you know, converted, you know, as it biodegrades, it converts to methane, which in some landfills are able to capture that and reuse it. Uh, methane is a very powerful climate pollutant. It, um, and, and short term, it, it captures a lot of heat. It's very dangerous. Um, or we're burying, you know, we're burning it um, in incinerators um, and mixing it with everything else. We're actually creating toxic, pro you know, products. Um, and if you ever try to, you can't light ice cream on fire. I mean, it's just, it's very wet. You know, it's as inefficient as as you get. Um, it's a terrible end source, you know, for food to end up. Um, and we actually have a positive uses, reuses for food. I mean, you compost it, return it to earth, return it to soil, sink some carbon. Um, so it's thinking about, you know, burying or burning, burning it. Um, it is terrible. And so this food waste bill, it's a start. It's targeting these largest uh, operators. Um, but that gives you, you know, then we can start having the systems. What are the bio digesters? You know, we can create, you know, the infrastructure that's going to handle this food waste. And it gets, a, you know, a lot of it out of these terrible systems. So those are a couple things that are on the table. Thanks, Eric. And then that's a good transition. Um, is Amy, you've worked a lot on workaround incinerators. Um, this is brought up in the film um, and the topic of waste to energy, how some incinerators are marketed as waste to energy, they might be a good solution, they might be part of a circular economy. So could you talk about, number one, the work um, in New Jersey around our incinerators, where are they, um, which communities are they impacting, and is this a good solution or, or what are our alternatives? Right, so um, incinerators in New Jersey, um, you know, originally when, when Governor Florio was the governor, he had this vision that there'd be an incinerator in every county. And there were only four incinerators built. Um, one of them was recently closed in Warren County, um, but uh, Camden, the city of Camden, uh, Rahway and Essex, um, Newark, the ironbound section of Newark are the last remaining incinerators. And the incinerator in uh, Newark, uh, about 50% of the waste is actually coming from New York City. So originally these 
were designed to address a, a, a landfill crisis and problem, you know, because we were not managing our landfills properly. Um, so everybody said, oh, incinerators were the answer. So, um, but they really weren't the answer. And, and the county that I live in, Monmouth County, they actually had a, a non-binding referendum vote to, to develop a non-burn plan because originally the county was planning to build an incinerator and didn't. But these are all in environmental justice communities. Um, you know, there was supposed to be one in Trenton uh, that was defeated uh, by work that we and others did at the local level. And they decided to abandon it basically because they, um, they realized that they were gonna lose their shirt, <laughs> their money. Um, and one of the things about these incinerators is um, the counties underwrite these uh, incinerators. They're built as county incinerators and then the counties become dependent on the money the revenue from these incinerators. So the drive to feed them, um, these, their insatiable appetites um, is tremendous. And the thing about plastics, as, as you saw in the movie, is that plastic is basically, you know, 90% or more fossil fuel, right? So that stuff burns like crazy. Um, and you need a good burner, you know, um, to get those high temperatures that you need. And if you don't have good high temperatures, then your pollution control devices don't work. And, and in Newark, it wasn't until very recently that they put uh, the, the best available technology pollution controls on it, uh, bag house filters. They didn't have bag house filters for 20 years and, and they, they were installed because they wanted another 20 year extension on their permit, which they did get, but they were required to put the, the, the um, pollution controls on it. And recently there was um, some pink plumes that came out because of some um, iodine waste that went into the incinerator that shouldn't have gone there. So when you mix plastic and newspaper together, you get dioxin and um, really bad combination. And we know that that stuff is going in. So um, one thing to connect the, the incinerator issue to the energy issue is that the incinerator issue industry has been trying to call incinerator is a class one renewable source of energy for a long time, for decades. And a class one renewable is solar and wind and incinerators are no solar and wind. <laughs> and the state has an energy master plan, which Eric didn't discuss, but it, it also could be part of the solution here is that the goal is to get to 100% clean energy um, by 2050. We wanna push the envelope you know, faster than that, but um, you know, electric vehicle bill and other things that have, you know, moving along um, would move us away from fossil fuels. And so if the state kept on target with its, with its goals, kept on target with how it manages and directs utilities to spend, you know, ratepayer dollars, um, we could reduce our dependence on fossil fuel in the, you know, the heating and, and electric industry and we need to make sure we keep incinerators out of that class one category. So the food waste bill, we defeated last year because they tried to sneak it in. <laughs> um, but when the go and our governor said, look, I'm not gonna make that a class one renewable. Um, when the new bill came up, it didn't have that language in it. So um, those are important things. Again, connecting that extraction to power production to all the way down to plastics, keep making the link. Whatever your passion is, whether your passion's about fracking or your passion's about plastics or incinerators, it's all connected and we all have to fight together. Thanks. And then I also wanna talk about, um, so the film shows how recyclers initially wanted to do the right thing, then were urged to take more and more materials from the city, you know, based on a real concern, but um, that there ended up being no market for because it couldn't really either economically or effectively be recycled. So um, I know New Jersey was the first state to require recycling by law in 1987. So what's kind of the, the history of recycling in New Jersey and how much do we really recycle? So, so we have to remember that recycling is managing waste and our whole goal is to not make the waste in the first place. So we have to keep emphasizing that and we have a program called Rethink Disposable that, that moves us in that direction, especially in the food 
food industry where so much of the stuff is produced. But New Jersey was supposed to get to 65% recycling, um, including construction debris. And a lot of the stuff, um, you know, that gets recycled and still is valuable to recycle is in the construction debris industry. Um, we're, depending on who you talk to and how you count the numbers, um, we were almost at 65%, but then Governor Whitman cut all the funding mechanisms for the local towns to do their master composting program and their recycling bins. And they, we've been able to sort of put some of that money back into the county programs, but it's been you know, much more limited and um, programs have been much less aggressive. And so, you know, maybe we're recycling, you know, they're saying we're recycling 40%, but if you go to a place like the city of Newark, you know, they admit maybe they're recycling 8%. So, um, and schools, they're mandated by law to recycle. Um, many, many schools don't recycle at all. So even if you do recycle, it's, um, again, you're managing waste. And um, we used to do a lot of source separation. You know, you have to separate the brown from the clear glass and the newspaper from the white paper and, you know, everything was separated and they went into different bins and you'd have multiple trucks going down your street collecting this stuff. Well, now we're doing single stream. And single stream, you know, you see single stream trucks coming down your street, they're basically your garbage truck. And that's really what your stuff is, is garbage. Um, because it's not separated. If you take a, a, a you know, a, a bottle that had peanut butter in it and you don't clean it out thoroughly, it's not recyclable, it's, it's trash. So most of our stuff ends up as trash and with no place to go, or it ends up in an incinerator or in a landfill. So um, the more we mix stuff together, the more it's contaminated, the more it's contaminated, the more it's trash and it has very little value and how many park benches can we make you know there's just so many of them um, and um, all the problems that it causes glass has not you know the market these are commodities and the markets go up and down so one day you could get a lot for your cardboard another day you can't um, the most valuable item is aluminum um, because it's much cheaper to, to reuse the, re, you know, the aluminum. But um, again, if there's no place to take it, it's trash. And um, TerraCycle, you know, a company here in, in uh, New Jersey, um, you know, does amazing things with kind of repurposing things like those Capri, you know, bags, but, you know, beverage bags, but, um, you know, it'll never be a big enough industry to be able to figure out what to do with all this stuff. So let's make less. That's what we should be doing. And, you know, 50 years ago, recycling was revolutionary. You know, people thought, oh, no one's ever going to do it. Well, you know, people are doing it not so well, but, <laughs> but um, the paradigm shift now is to make less waste um, and, um, you know, maybe start fixing the things that we throw out instead of throwing them out like the printer that's sitting on my front porch right now. So um, this is a question that comes up, comes up often. There's a lot of focus on the material plastic and, you know, the film is called The Story of Plastic. Um, the film also talks briefly about biodegradable alternatives. Number one, about being clear about labels and what labels actually mean, and the difference between bioplastic and biodegradable material. Um, and there's often questions, oh, well, is paper or a compostable, compostable material any better? Um, so, uh, Amy, could you talk a bit about that? I can also answer that. Yeah. Um, well, basically, you know, we, base, we basically believe that almost all of that advertising of biodegradable is um, not true. It's fake news. <laughs> um, and there are even questions, you know, you see these things, you know, corn starch based and this and that. But 
very often they're mixed with other things that really aren't biodegradable. And if you bury something in a landfill, it's not going to get air and it's not going to biodegrade. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it doesn't work that way. And even, you know, people who, who might get these compostable plates or containers, um, you can't, you know, unless you put it in an industrial composting facility, it's not biodegradable. Um, you can't chop up one of those compostable plates and, and put them in your backyard composter and expect it to compost anytime soon. So um, use, a, use a reusable plate, <laughs> you know, use a reusable fork, uh, use a reusable container. Uh, you know, demand that your stores um, use reusable things. Um, bring your own bags, you know, bring the bags that you put your vegetables in. I mean, you just, the more you do it, the more you'll see other people do it too. So let's create the new norm. Um, so, um, and very often what, what really happens with these biodegradables is they just turn into small little bits, just like plastics become microplastics, so do these biodegradables. And I know more, you probably know more about some of this stuff, but that's the basics. It's a lie. <laughs> Yeah, and it's also important to remember, as um, this film shows the full life cycle of plastic, any material also has impacts along its life cycle if it's designed to be thrown out. Um, and you want to make sure that you're considering those, even if it might be better for the environment than a plastic would be when it's thrown out on the waste end still want to consider the impacts that it had in production, extraction, and so that's why reusable, like you said, is the best mm -hmm. um, way to go. So someone asked a question, make less is great, how can we make this happen? <laughs> um, so I, the film talked a little bit at the end about extended producer responsibility, EPR, um, there is a really great bill introduced in Congress currently. It's called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. And it's a very in-depth, covers a lot of different areas of this issue, um, but specifically focuses on holding the producers responsible for um, the, the materials that are wasted. And so that's something that I would recommend looking into um, if you're interested in that at the national, national level. Um, and any version of extended producer responsibility um, is a good, good way to go. So pushing for, for more of that. Um, also supporting businesses that are zero waste. I know there's a few in this area that are refill shops. There's more and more um, businesses starting for takeout um, containers, like a t reusable takeout container exchange. So it's definitely not wide scale yet, but as these, as these things start becoming more popular, just support those um, is definitely, will definitely make a larger shift. Um, one thing, one thing I wanted to suggest in that front is that um, according to the state uh, health code, and we've gone all the way to the top, you know, the Department of Health um, Commissioner, um, you can uh, use your own uh, takeout containers when you go to a restaurant. If you have you know, if you get a meal and you have extra food, you can put your own food in, in your own containers. You can, if you go to a, we're not doing buffets now in a COVID world and we may never get them again, who knows, but um, you can bring your containers in. The, the caveat is you can't have that container go into the back, you know, kitchen. You have to keep it in the front, you know. So, um, you know, if you're getting takeout and you're, and you're gonna go pick it up, you know, they can make the food and put it, drop it into your container. Um, that's one way to do it. Um, another is, you know, use, you know, bring your own uh, bags, you know, net bags or, or other things. Um, I went to a, a, a dollar store and they have, you know, if you're a woman, you probably know this better than, than others, you know, you put your hosiery or your delicates into these little net bags where you can buy three for a dollar 
you don't have to go onto some uh, exotic website to you know buy some of this stuff. Yes, it is made of nylon, um, but it has a little zipper on it, and you can put your vegetables in it and you know use it every day. Um, and you know it's at least a durable product. So you want to be using as many things as, that are durable and reusable as you can. And and there's obviously other items that are you know, less breakable, non-plastic, if you want to get away from plastic altogether. Uh, Maura, I got a question for you. Yeah. Uh, this is from our, our the chat. Uh, so do you know of any states or countries that are currently regulating and or, you know, taxing plastic production, either uh, importing upfront or is this handled by deposit, bottle deposits? Um, so is it, where, what are they doing in some other places? And, and I think Europe is leading in a lot of ways uh, and we're still catching up. But so if, if you could talk a little bit about what others are doing. Yeah, there's, um, it's right now, it's kind of more of a patchwork. Different places are kind of doing different components. Um, obviously, places all over the world are fighting fossil fuel industry. Um, so coming from the supply end of fighting this issue, but um, I know the EU has one of the strongest bans on single-use plastic items. This was talked about briefly in the film. They kind of started at look by looking at what are the easiest things to replace. Um, so they talked about bags, um, you know, little Q-tips, um, things like that. So I would say they're one of the, the strongest. I don't know of a country that has a strong extended producer responsibility policy yet. I could be wrong. I know people are obviously thinking about it as we are here in the US. Um, but that would be one of the strongest ways to go about it because it covers a lot of different areas, but there's countries all over the world doing the plastic bag bans or fees and on some other common single-use plastic items. Um, and then another um, important side is you saw, touched upon this briefly in the, in the film too, how waste, um, waste sorters and kind of formally recognizing and incorporating waste workers, especially, you know, formerly people who were more on the informal part of the economy, the waste pickers, um, incorporating them more, you know, solidly into the economy helps with reduction and reuse significantly. And so there are definitely countries that are starting to do more of that. Um, I think it, it was somewhere in South America, they, they started doing this. And before they were just the you know, people who would go to the dump and try to sort out materials that they could, that they could resell or repurpose, but then they kind of formerly made them waste sorters who would go into the community and help with um, separating waste. And that allowed them to repurpose a lot more and divert a lot more waste from going into landfills or incinerators. So that's kind of another angle that some countries are taking. So I guess my point is you can, as this kind of system is very broad, there's different things happening along each step of the way all over the world. And that's why I think it's, it's important for us to look at, okay, what are the steps that we're participating in here so that we can have an impact at least on our own part in that system. And, and what I'm hoping for is, you know, we, we talk about a paradigm shift, right? Recycling was what we did 30 years ago. We, we just need to completely rethink about how we handle this waste. And, and what the system that we have right now um, makes it difficult. Someone asks, you know, how, what are we doing to get rid of the incinerators? But you know, what happens is you know, we take our trash out on Tuesdays and Thursdays and, and, and we wake up in the morning and it's gone. You know? um, but we, we know that this is going to you know, low income communities to get burned. You know, we saw in the video you know, these um, 
you know, we, we, sh we put it on, on cargo container ships and we ship it to China and, and, and you, know, send, you, know, deal, you know, they're gonna deal with our waste. You know, so, um, you know, really working at this local level. I mean, if we had to, you know, I'm, I'm in the, I'm Montclair, it's a pretty cool town, pretty hip up here. You know, but if we had to deal with, you know, 100% of our own waste, you know, we, we come up with some alternative solutions really quickly, you know, but this whole, the system that we have where it just, it disappears um, and it primarily gets buried in, in low income communities, these, these separators, the recycling separators, it, it's a very low wage paying job. It's dangerous, it's unsanitary, you know, but, and um, so we just, we, we, we source it out um, to, the, to the lowest, you know, income, you know, residents, um, the most vulnerable populations. It's, it's not fair. So we need to really think about this paradigm shift. So one of the things that, that Europe did, and this was decades ago already, is that they basically said, if you, you make a product you ha and you package it, you know, and it, you have to pay or take back the packaging. Um, and so for, for, you know, a long time, and in fact, deconstructing cars, right? That's Germany does a lot of, of that. Um, you know, they take the car back and they deconstruct it. But so the EU and, and the industries there and the companies there started figuring out, oh, well, we'll package it this way. It'll have less packaging in it. Or, um, you know, we've, we had a fight, a campaign here in New Jersey to get rid of mercury switches. You know, every time you open your trunk, you know, you have a mercury switch. Where in Europe, they had already banned mercury switches. They weren't in Japan. They weren't in Europe. So, you know, what they ban in Europe doesn't necessarily mean they ban it everywhere else. So, like, we might get the more toxic option actually here in the United States. And while we've banned DDT in the United States, they're using it in food in Mexico. So, you know, the, I think, you know, the reality is, is that it's, we have to act locally, but there's also national and international policies that, that we need to do. And um, companies in Europe are required to pay or take back stuff, but they have enough money where if they pay, it doesn't really matter. It's like they could be caught polluting, but it's cheaper for them to pollute and get caught every once in a while than it is to actually do the right thing. And so we have to, you know, change that dynamic. And last thing I want to say is um, I, I went to Rutgers when my daughter was first looking at colleges and she decided to go to Rutgers and um, they were having a fair. And at the fair, they had a table and at the table, they were promoting their, their um, materials uh, in engineering department. And I was sort of floored, but the third largest industry in the whole world is packaging. And so, you know, we're not just talking about the fossil fuel industry, we're talking about the packaging industry being the third largest, bigger than agriculture, bigger than lots of other things that we do. So, um, you know, we have a lot to do, but they also, they're gonna market this stuff. And the more we do e-commerce, the more we're packaging, the more we have things wrapped, secured, and in plastic. So think about that when you're making your next order. <laughs> and, and the movie highlighted, you know, the companies when they're, when they're demanded to, where you put these, you know, um, you know what, what, here's the better responsibility, here's what you have to do. They do it in the places that they have to do it and they're yeah. perfectly happy, you know, not doing it in the, uh, you know, at, at other right. places. Um, so I, I had a couple of questions come through about what's going on with um, plastic bag bans during the COVID-19 mm -hmm. crisis. Um, so there, for, for some of you um, who may not know, the plastics industry during the pandemic has kind of used this as a time to try to either stall or postpone enforcement of local ordinances on single-use plastics and this is happening all over the country um, they're claiming that plastics specifically single-use throwaway plastics are safer than reusables that reusables might carry carry the virus um this is just not not true 
um, but it has resulted in some towns in New Jersey um, postponing the enforcement of their local ordinances. Um, so I, I would say, especially right now, it's important to make sure we're listening to science on, you know, making decisions on what's safe and, you know, not listening to what industry is saying. Um, there's been studies that say plas um, the virus can last up to three days on the surface of plastic, which is less on the surface of other items. But it's also important to note that the representatives of the CDC have said publicly that surface contact, there's very low chance of contracting the virus through surface contact. So even if, you know, if we want to be as careful as possible, washing surfaces, that means washing reusables because they are washable, would be the safest way to go. And that the argument that single use plastics are safer, you know, is, is kind of not based on any, any real science. Um, so that's important for you all to know just personally, um, as we're kind of all navigating this, but also if your town is considering um, you know, stalling their enforcement or thinking about doing a plastic bag ordinance or other use, other single use plastic ordinance. Um, it can still be done. Um, a couple towns just in the past couple weeks went ahead and not, not only, you know, they, they passed them or strengthened um, existing ordinance, ordinances that they had. So people are still realizing that the plastics industry is spreading around these myths and moving ahead and doing the right thing anyway. So, so the, you know, one thing to keep in mind on this is that, um, you know, uh, even if they say that, um, you know, things stay on plastic for three days or COVID might stay on plastic for three days, if you have more plastic bags, We'll just rotate them, you know, wash them or rotate them. Um, cloth, you can just put right into your, you know, into a washing machine, or you could, you know, if you don't have a washing machine, you could wash it in your sink and hang it, hang it out to dry. Um, you touching your things in your bag with your products that you bought instead of having somebody else handle single use plastic bags that were put into the box, put into the truck, put into the store, put onto the rack. Every time somebody else is touching it, you should just touch your own stuff, you know, and take your own stuff with you. So, um, you know, I, I've been using the slogans like, keep it to yourself, you know, <laughs> like keep your stuff to yourself, use your own stuff. You know where it came from, you know where it's been. And uh, that's a good protection. And, and as Maura said, there's no, there's no evidence and no reason to believe that you can't use your reusable bags. You should use them. Um, it's better for all of us. And in fact, as Maura said, towns are still passing ordinances. Um, you know, and, and many towns said, heck no, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to change my ordinance at all. So um, we sent a letter to the towns asking them and, and telling them don't, don't crash under the industry's pressure and you know, many towns said, no, we're not changing anything. Uh, we're gonna still move ahead, so. So I guess we're almost out of time. We have one question um, about how much economic sacrifice would be needed to make a positive environmental impact. Um, and I think, can you, can each of you kind of mention, talk a bit about how these things don't necessarily have to be separate. Often environmental improvements also result in economic improvements. And specifically, you know, when it comes to waste, I can talk a bit about that. Um, waste prevention and reusables save businesses money over time. They save towns money over time who have to foot the bill for, um, you know, waste management, um, which, you know, is ultimately paid for by taxpayers. So um, ultimately, there's a lot of things in the environmental 
movement that are also good for the economy as well. But could each of you talk briefly about that? Well, on, um, you know, on food waste, we're talking about creating a whole new sort of market um, for the pro for something that is was considered waste, but really is a product and then uh, it shouldn't really be called food waste, right? It's um, because it's not really a waste if you put it to a proper use. So um, the law requires facilities to be within 25 miles of, of uh, a source of, of food scraps and, and food products. Um, that means that, you know, we could have industries uh, here uh, who could be doing the right thing. We could be hiring and training people you know, from engineers to, you know, people who um, have not as many skills. So along a variety of fronts, we could do things that are more community-based. Um, if we were not just looking at the waste side, but also looking at the, the uh, energy side, there, there could be more opportunities around um, community energy sources and energy efficiency and and other efforts that actually employs people and trains people who've been largely left out of the economy and, and puts people to work who've been um, forced into unemployment um, because of COVID-19. So, um, you know, there are many opportunities and, and, you know, it's been, for decades, it's been known that we could create uh, many times more jobs in a renewable and a green economy than we can in a fossil fuel economy. You don't hire very many people in an incinerator. Um, you know, they might be there to build it, but once it's built, there's not very many people hired, not compared to doing another kind of operation. And, and, in, and with food scraps, say you build the digester, well, then you have to package up this, the material, right? Or you have to um, turn it into a, a fertilizer or you need to get it back into the land. I mean, all of that requires people to do that work. So better to put more people to work in a more diverse economy with a wide variety of skills that brings people into the economy, um, whether you're living in a city or living in a rural area. So all of those have pluses for us. Uh, put, putting more people to work in good paying jobs that have health care benefits. You know, right now with this pollution, the, the, the costs are externalized. The companies are profiting. You know, these are big companies. Um, you know, so not only uh, we think that there's new, there's different um, opportunities, um, but they could also be, be good paying jobs, you know, where people are paid a living wage and um, are able to have health, you know, health care benefits. Um, there's just one, I'll come back to this, you know, more jobs. Um, I, I don't agree that there's an economic sacrifice to, to be made. Uh, but someone asked about, you know, this, um, in the movie, they talked about sh fracking and then shipping the, the, the natural gas overseas. And that's one of the projects that we're fighting here in New Jersey. It, it's in Gibbstown, um, Penn, Gib Gibbstown, New Jersey. It's on the Delaware River, south end of um, the state and Salem County. That would be New Jersey's first export facility. Um, and, and so that, um, you know, that's one of the projects that we're fighting. But I, there's, we're talking about new industries. I, I, I think, well, I guess you answered the question very well, uh, but I disagree that there's economic sacrifice. I think that there's, um, that there is opportunities for better paying jobs uh, that people can support themselves, have healthcare, you know, and, and, and the multinational, you know, companies that are taking advantage, you know, um, should be paying, you know, the, the price of their pollution. And I, and I would just also say that, you know, I've been in this fight a long time. I, I mean, I started organizing 1979 and, um, you know, as long as Exxon and Dow and those companies can control a centralized market or PSCNG control a centralized power source, they're going to do everything they can to hold on to it. And they don't really care what they're making or how much it makes you sick. Um, they're not going to pay for that. They're just going to make their profits and please their stockholders. That's their purpose. They're not there for societal good. They're there for, to make their stockholders happy. You have to look at what their mission is and what their responsibility is. It's not to us. And so if they can, you know, harness the sun and they get all the benefit, they're going to do it, or they're going to control all the patents for all the good things that could be done. They will do that. And in fact, they have done that on many fronts 
you know, they promise the smaller solar company in Vermont, you know, hey, we'll invest in you and you'll be able to, you know, do all this great stuff. And as soon as, and they think, oh, great, now we can get to the next level of this amazing solar cell. And they get bought up by Exxon or whoever, and um, they deep six them. You know, they just, they can't ever do the work again because now they don't control the patents, they don't control any of it. So, you know, decentralized power, decentralized economies, economies that are more rooted in our communities in the way that we want them. You know, some people might call that radical, but um, I don't call it radical. I just call it, you know, it's a human economy and that's what we need instead of a petrochemical economy. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Amy. Okay, so we're just about out of time, but I want to um, leave everyone with, I had a question about how do we get involved in your fights? Um, I'm going to post in the comments section links to actions that you can take right now. This first one will be on our Empower NJ work opposing fossil fuel infrastructure projects. Um, and then the second one will be um, urging our legislative leadership in New Jersey to move our plastic bag and styrofoam ban forward as soon as possible. And we're always um, putting, we're always working on new things. So you can always check our website for more actions to take. Um, if you're on our emails, um, read them. Updating <laughs> what's going on and more ways you can be involved. Uh, more ways you can volunteer with you know, zero waste events. Obviously, we're not helping out with events right now because they're all canceled, but that is something that we will get back to doing in the future. Um, and, you know, obviously, we put all of these on our Facebook and social media as well. So these are things you can, you can start with. Um, let's if you're a writer and you like to write, you know, we, we're always writing writing blogs you can contact Mora and see if there's something that you might be able to help with on a particular topic don't hesitate to reach out so again if you care about energy we have empower new jersey if you care about you know reducing our use of single-use disposables we have rethink disposable and and, and Mora uh, leads that effort um, you know, so we go from the big, you know, the front end to the back end and, uh, we, we fight, you know, for solutions, not just, we're not just a bunch of whiners and complainers. <laughs> uh, we fight for solutions. So getting the food waste bill passed, working to get better, you know, energy policies, um, uh, making sure that we're regulating methane and carbon, all of these things are, are part of the mix of getting to where, uh, we want to go. So okay. Mara, I'll let you, or Eric, close out. Well, well, Mark can close. One other thing is I, I, I do want to thank everyone that was on today. We also had uh, folks on Facebook Live. This video will be on, on Facebook Live. So uh, you can share it there. When we're done here, hopefully Mara can, can add some of the links for resources in case you close the window and they're gone. We, we'll put them you know, so that they're attached to the video so you can share here. Um, and then also, I'm sorry that we didn't get to everyone's questions today, but um, I think everyone that's here either registered in some way, shape, or form. So. We'll have a log and we'll like to, you know, we can follow up with some individuals and, and some of these are, are, you know, you know, how do we fix society? And, and we don't have all the answers yet. Um, and that's my little daughter uh, <laughs> chiming in here saying. Uh, Doing this now. for a reason. Daddy, uh, please stop working. <laughs> <laughs> um, so more, you can take us home. Yeah, um, we will definitely follow up with any remaining questions and I'll again send you some of the resources that have more of the studies and things that were um the resources for the movie itself um so keep an eye out for that and also if you'd like to participate in another screening or watch watch it again or share it with someone else who you might um who you think might be interested our other State offices will be hosting screenings over the next couple weeks. So I will post the link. This is from our website. Um, they can also register for these. You don't have to be from the state that is hosting the film to participate. Um, you know, it's going to be the same film and 
same setup where you can watch, you know, on your own time, and then you can choose to participate in their question and answer as well. So I guess we'll end there. Thank you, everyone, for for participating, for watching the film, and for getting involved with our actions. Right. Stay safe and keep organizing. <laughs> we'll see you next.